Hello, Suzanne. Hi, Tyrone. How are you? I am well. Good. I can't see you. Oh, there you there there I am. <laughs> Want to make sure my lighting is right? Yeah, uh, it looks good. Oh, looks okay, really good. great. <laughs> I'm going to let our pres uh, our vice president in now. She's going to run the, the meeting because John Leonard is out of the country today. Okay. Thank you very much for being with us today. We appreciate it. Oh, it's an honor. I uh, appreciate the invitation. There she is. There's Nas. Hi. Hello, Nas. How are you? I am well. I am well. Glad to, to uh, be on the call and uh, a part of the meeting. We're happy to have you and um, really great timely subject too. So we're really excited to hear what you have to say. Oh, well, um, thank you. Yeah, this is the first meeting that I'm um, chairing. So um, it might be awkward, but it'll be fine. I'll go with the flow. I'll go with the flow. <laughs> exactly. Go with the flow. Keep it light. Mm. You'll be fine, Nas. Thank you. And yeah, we're going to just wait a few minutes and let a few more people in. Nas, you'll do great. Thank you, John. You're uh, here. I'm here. And not, not only that, but I'm fully vaccinated now. I've had yes, so shots. Yes, so exciting. Yay. Yay. That's great. How does it feel? Does it feel, are you relieved? Oh, man. It's like I can go, I, I'm invincible now. Oh. <laughs> careful, careful, because you're not. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure, but you're not. I know. <laughs> I kept saying to everybody, it's the only time I wish I was just a little bit older so I could get the shot, but I'm not in the group yet. So, um, I'm not be soon, though. either, and I'm okay with that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> people are coming in. It's always exciting to see people get the gallery of people who are here. And we're into almost the end of February. It's like this year is just like zooming by. Oh, I think January was just so full of so many things that uh, it just absorbed all of our attentions. And we were all hoping that 2021 would uh, be very different from 2020, but uh, it doesn't seem that it's uh, that big of a difference, at least at this point, but we shall see. We shall see. It's early days yet. Yeah. <laughs> I would say I, there's so much more optimism for me this year. I mean, it's true. 2021 has been like in dog years so far, but, <laughs> but there's so much hope and, and, and joy and, and people with double vaccines. And it's just, you know, it's all just getting better and better and better. We just have to hang in there a day at a time. Yeah. Yes. So, Wendy, theory. Wendy, I just have to say you're the epitome of hope and optimism. So, um, I've, that's one of the things I've always enjoyed about working with you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> hey, we had a rough year last year. We lost my sister in law to COVID. We had oh, my five or six family members get COVID oh, in Arizona man. and Washington State. My husband had a heart attack on the bike trail. I mean, it was a tough year. Oh, but, my goodness. But we're, you know, we're doing, we're doing great. It wow. should be the alternative, right? Yeah. So, so is yeah. your husband is your husband recovered well? Th thank you for asking. It was four months ago yesterday. So he um, most days yes, some days he's still you know. Oh man, still he's still in cardiac rehab and and still but he's very athletic and that helps a lot. He doesn't yeah. drink or smoke or have high blood pressure or diabetes and so he they say he will fully recover by six months. Wow. Oh, that's so, great. Thank God wow. he's so athletic. Yeah. Uh, and not a couch yep. potato. The cardiologist said most of his clients are couch, two thirds of them are like couch potatoes and they would not have done as well as Tom did. So yeah, that's good to know. Good, good. Um, Suzanne, tell me when we're ready to go. And um, I think most of the, most of uh, the members are in right now. I'll keep letting them in as uh, you're get, getting going here. All right, sounds good. So I'm gonna kick off the meeting. Um, good afternoon. My name is Naz Ali Khan, and I'm vice president um, of our chapter. And um, John Leonard is um, on the road today and couldn't join us. So I'm going to be taking the meeting. You get me. Um, but thank you for coming. And um, it's our February meeting. So um, 
I wanted to just get started. We have a great speaker today, looking forward to it. Um, the Sacramento chapter is looking for um, sponsors for our monthly membership and um, at half price, no less. So they're a great deal at 150 per sponsor. Um, and the sponsorship perks include 60 second spot to promote your business, your company logo and hyperlink on the Sacramento chapter website um, and marketing materials. Um, if you're interested, please contact Suzanne. Um, that sounds like a really good deal. So we want to uh, thank this month's sponsors. So um, a 60 second spot goes to both Paul Kuna of Deacon Construction and Lexi Howard with Murphy Austin Adams Chumfield LLP. So Paul, is Paul in? Do we see him? Nope. How about- I don't, think, I don't think he's here yet. I don't see him. All right. What about Lexi? I'm here. All right, good. Do Hello, you have everyone. Yes, thank you. On behalf of Murphy Austin and LAI members, including myself and partners, Russell Austin and Suzanne Hennessy, we are pleased to sponsor this month's program and cede the rest of our time to the program. Thank you all for being here. Great, and thank you for the sponsorship, really appreciate it. And if Paul comes towards the end, we can um, give him his 60 seconds. That would be great. Um, Randy's gonna introduce our speaker. We're really excited to have him here. And um, I think it's a very topical um, subject for us to hear about today. Um, and I just wanted to um, say, if you could wait a few minutes at the end after the speaker, um, John Weber. Actually, John, do you wanna um, take a few minutes right now to talk yep. about our Land sure. Economic Weekend, which is going to be in May and we're going to be hosting. So John's our chair. Go for it. Okay. Why don't I do that? Um, hi, I'm John Weber. I chair the uh, LEW, the Land Economic Weekend uh, Committee that's planning this. And it's, uh, it's, it's super exciting. This is, uh, we have a date. Uh, this is May 5th through 8th. 2022. So it's a, a year and three months from now. Uh, and we're going to host it. We're, we'll have um, probably 150 LAI members from across the country and internationally arrive in Sacramento. And we have a three day uh, entertainment of these important VIP folks. And uh, so we're the hosts. And I hope that uh, uh, all of you join us in in uh, showing showcasing this town of ours. We've got a lot of things to. We've got uh, generally. I'd like to just say that we've got an agenda. This is a Thursday night. Um, everybody arrives at the host hotel, which is the Hyatt Regency. We've we've uh, gotten a uh, a deal with them that's pretty uh, good pricing, uh, and we'll have a, a president's. Uh, um, reception at uh, Randy Getz has generously offered his uh, top floor uh, suite at, at uh, on Capitol Mall overlooking the city. So we'll have a, a, a reception there. And then in the morning, uh, we start a, a series of, of, of uh, tours. Uh, we're gonna be touring um, uh, R Street, uh, showcasing all of the development on R Street from the from the uh, uh, artists' warehouse uh, lofts to ice block, and uh, and then in the afternoon we'll be going to the rail yards and and showing off uh, uh, th those developments. There's uh, will the soccer stadium will be under construction hopefully by that time, and we'll have the 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 um, a lot of uh, Ke uh, Larry Kelly's development going on. And then uh, we'll end up with a, a cocktail uh, thing at the end at the Powerhouse Science Center on the river. Uh, that that uh, and then in in then everybody's off on their own for dinner. And in the morning uh, we we come back together and we we do the um, the whole K Street, starting with the convention center, ending up at Doco, and uh, providing a uh, then at the end of it all a big soiree dinner. At the uh, at the Sutter Club. Uh, now all of those have uh, um, opportunities for 
uh, members to showcase uh, themselves by sponsoring uh, a, a parts or all of the events. And so I encourage you not just to look at, at absolutely participate in, in tours or, or volunteer being a docent or, or helping explain the story because we have a lot of stories to tell, but also I, I wanna ask you all to consider sponsoring a part of this. There's a lot of expenses associated. We're just building this right now and uh, we'll package it up in, in manageable chunks and come back to you with a, a proposal for your, your consideration to, to um, either volunteer, sponsor, or attend uh, any, any part or all the events. So that's my uh, pitch. Thank you, John, that's great. Thanks, great. really appreciate it. And um, it's gonna be a really exciting um, few days here in May, 2022. Um, so we'll give you more information as we work through everything and um, report back. And there's really, as John said, a really um, good opportunity for everyone to get involved. So um, uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Randy. Thank you. Um, I'm so pleased that Tyrone Williams has agreed to speak to us today. This is a fascinating man. He's the Deputy Executive Director of Development at the Sacramento Housing and Redevelopment Agency. And uh, I think it's fair to characterize him as an urban revitalization trailblazer. Uh, his development activities have been at the forefront of neighborhood transformation efforts across the country, specifically Boston, Houston, Atlanta, and now in Sacramento. He is considered an industry leader in affordable housing finance, organizational management, real estate and community development, project implementation and organizational management. Uh, he has spent about 20 years successfully leading multi-million dollar large scale comprehensive revitalization initiatives totaling over $1.5 billion. In 2020, his office here in Sacramento pr provided over $250 million in multifamily affordable housing financing, which included bonds and loans. He's got a full plate from an occupational standpoint. He also directs first time home buyer programs, compliance monitoring of over 1200 single family loans and portfolio management of 1,300 loans, totaling about $321 million. In addition, and hopefully this is something that he addresses at least tangentially, um, in addition to his development activities, he also directs activities of the Sacramento Promise Zone. He is presently coordinating partnerships with over 150 nonprofit governmental and local organizations to expand services to underserved neighborhoods in the Sacramento Metro. Please join me in welcoming Tyrone Roderick Williams. Well, thank you, uh, Randy. And what a joy um, and honor it is for me to spend some time talking with you all today. You know, uh, I, I, I uh, had the opportunity to speak with Randy early on and, and um, shared with him uh, how uh, I thought this was like perfect timing. If there were, was ever a time to invite me to come and speak, this is it. So today I'm gonna to be talking about a paradigm shift, a change in how we do things and how we uh, see things and how we legislate policies and procedures to address the affordable housing crisis. Um, but before I, I dive in, and I'm very cognizant of my time, so I'm gonna, I've got some key points and I'm gonna share with them. But I just want to say, pause, uh, February is a month when we highlight the achievements of African Americans here in the United States. And I could not speak to you all without acknowledging uh, the incredible role that Samuel J. Cullors played uh, in establishing the chapter here in Sacramento. But he and I have backgrounds that have aligned in so many ways. He was the uh, first professionally trained African-American in the United States. Uh, and he got his uh, Master of City Planning degree uh, from MIT, then went on to become the Deputy Director of Development at, uh, in Hartford, 
served uh, in Thailand and Canada and Chicago, was the chief urban planning uh, director here in the state, California Office of Planning, opened up his own office here. But his number one goal was that of fighting for civil rights and inclusion in the field of planning and, and opening up doors of opportunity. So I, I want to acknowledge the incredible, incredible role that he has played. And, uh, and like him, I have, uh, I've graduated from MIT with the exact same degree. I'm currently serving as the deputy director uh, here uh, at the Sacramento Housing and Redevelopment Agency. And I too am totally committed to opening up doors of opportunity for people like me and others who generally have not had the chance to uh, sit in certain circles. And so I often think if Mr. Colliers was here today in his honor, I wonder how would he view the activities and the membership of your organization that he was instrumental in founding and its commitment to the values and issues that guided his life. So in honor of him and in honor of Black History Month, I pause to acknowledge the incredible work of Samuel J. Cullis. Uh, now on to the topic for today. You know, we are all aware that we're in the middle of a housing crisis. It's not anything new. And what I wanna talk about is how we have to shift our thinking. The definition of insanity is to keep doing the same thing the same way and expecting a different outcome or a different result. And so I wanna to talk to you for just a few minutes about some policies that I believe will really help shift, move us away from the crisis that we're in and begin to lay the foundation for creating a, a country where everyone can have a decent and affordable house to live in uh, as, a, as a matter of how we operate here in the United States. You know, it's, uh, it, it, it's no secret that at this point, we've got challenges regarding home buying, we've got challenges for renters, and all of that combined is creating uh, a, a crisis. And I'm not using that word just as a kind of willy-nilly. We are, we know what a crisis is in when it comes to a pandemic. We've experienced that over the last year or so, but we have a crisis in the housing market and it in many ways has detrimental impacts and effects. And I think we've been going around the mulberry bush on not making very much impact because we haven't really made a commitment as a country to see this not just as a capitalistic endeavor, but an essential element in the democracy and in the quality of life that we anticipate and expect for all Americans. You know, the United States has a housing affordability crisis from home buying standpoint. Home buying prices are rising far more uh, than wages. In about 80% of the U.S. market, uh, renters are priced out of the market. And so that even if they want to buy a home, their income versus the rate of increases uh, in the pricing of home has outpaced them. For renters, approximately 18.5 um, uh, million households are spending more than half their income in housing. And so the renters are in a category that has moved to about 30% more people are being priced out of housing over the last five years. And nowhere in the country is there uh, a place where a single individual who is earning minimum wage, working 40 hours per week, can afford a modest two bedroom apartment without being cost burdened. So to think that you can work hard go to work every day and still not be able to live in a modest, we're not talking about the luxury uh, industry, we're talking about making ends meet because of the minimum wage. And I know there's a lot of discussion going on about 
increasing the minimum wage and the negative pot uh, potential impacts of that. But if we have a place, a, a country where if you work hard every day, you could still end up being homeless, that requires a shift. That's one of the areas where we have to say, it's no longer okay for the housing market and housing availability to not be available for people who work hard every day, trying to achieve the American dream, but never being able to realize it and being locked into poverty, particularly because wages and rent and housing prices are completely out of sync. And we cannot have uh, that as the status quo and move out of the crisis. To afford a, a basic two bedroom apartment, um, that you got to be able to be working uh, at a wage of about $20 an hour. But when you look at that, most people are uh, really in the seven to $10 an hour, which means you got to work over 115 hours a week just to be able to rent a two bedroom apartment. Now, many of us on this call may not be rent burdened. Many of us on this call may not be priced out of the housing market, but thousands and millions of people every day find themselves completely priced out. So how do we begin to address this? Let's talk about some paradigm shifts. Number one, I think that um, we've seen a lot of discussion about um, major employers in the Bay Area getting engaged in uh, supporting affordable housing, both rental and uh, housing because of uh, providing housing for their employees, whether that's contributing to funds that build a house, or I suggest that we look at creating tax incentives for employers, where there is an incentive to provide employee-based housing from the industrial age here in the United States. It was not uncommon to find employee-based housing. Uh, the, the whole Ford uh, plants had whole neighborhoods that supported housing where their workers could afford to live and work. And that's an idea that really lost uh, prominence um, really kind of out of the 40s and 50s. But I think as we talk about paradigm shifts, I think large corporations who have large uh, employee uh, workforces should look at getting tax incentives that support either the funding of affordable housing or the financing of affordable housing. The other is to decentivize poverty. We are the public housing authority for the city and the county. So when I talk about de-incentivizing uh, poverty, when a person who is in public housing reaches a, a, an income where they no longer qualify for the, the, the funding of public housing, they lose all of the supports. So when you earn enough to actually begin to save up enough money to move out of public housing, then you lose your child care support, you lose many of the food stamps and benefits. So the safety net is yanked out from under you just as you are trying to get your head above water. I, I've had numerous conversations with people who have tried to go to school, had to get a student loan to, to cover some costs, but then that loan cost, uh, counts as income, and then they don't qualify for many of the public housing benefits. I think in, as we talk about a change and a paradigm shift, first of all, we've got to incentivize people being able to move up out of public housing and not pull the safety net or the rug out from under them just at the point that they're beginning to get some level of family self-sufficiency. That's a change in paradigm shift because right now the, the incentive is to stay uh, engaged in a low income poverty state to be able to benefit uh, from the federal resources. And I think that that's, that's counterproductive. There are all, even wealthy people get, get benefits for being wealthy. 
homeowners get benefits for buying a home. I think there should be a benefit from trying to move out of poverty into family self-sufficiency. That requires a paradigm shift. I think we also want to look at the policies that, um, that are in place. One is, I think, uh, across the board, uh, what I have seen and what we're seeing across the country is that there is still racial discrimination. I know that it's no, you know, African Americans are not being hung from trees in the South, but they're being shot with, you know, innocent by, uh, without weapons. Uh, and there are still major, major racial disparities and housing has been one of the most, uh, has had the most significant impact on racial disparities and it has been supported by federal, state and local policies. And we've got to not only acknowledge them because I think there is beginning to be an acknowledgement that there has been an, an attempt to block the advancement or the expansion of people of color being able to move into certain neighborhoods, into certain uh, housing developments. And we've got to begin to address that because that's part of the legacy. We have a lot of communities that have been locked out of the opportunity to get loans um, to improve those buildings and improve their homes so that they don't end up in disrepair and losing uh, property value. So that's another paradigm shift, not only to recognize the, the state, federal, and local impacts that have created situations that we currently find ourselves in in Sacramento, but looking at how do we repair the damage and propel people forward so that they can achieve the American dream just like everybody else. And part of that is neighborhood revitalization, looking at how do we revitalize our neighborhoods. One is the federal government has basically gotten out of uh, the affordable housing business. But the federal government is the same government that created thousands of home ownership opportunities uh, after uh, World War II. It has got to come back in and see this as an obligation and an opportunity to move people from uh, a housing crisis to housing stability. And so home ownership uh, and supporting housing education, counseling and providing assistance with down payment and broadening uh, the affordability of safe mortgages is an absolutely essential element. And to leave it to the market, uh, I, I, th I think is, is a missed opportunity and um, requires a shift that there must be, just like there was the GI Bill and other bills that benefited individuals, there must be a housing policy bill that promotes home ownership, that looks to address the inequities of the past regarding redlining and, 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 mortgage, and the lack of availability of mortgages. And not only that, we're talking about a paradigm shift, but also looking at the disparities of the way that um, houses uh, and black neighborhoods are uh, evaluated when it comes to um, their appraisals. It's absolutely, uh, I'm, I'm flabbergasted with some of the information that I've been able to see where an African-American who buys the exact same house as a white American, the same floor plan, they maintain the house the same way that there, by the time that, that home owner comes to look at an appraisal, there is a, a could be up to a 15 to 20% difference in how the black homeowner's home is appraised compared to the white homeowner's appraisal. That's happening today. That's not something that was in the 20s and the 50s. That's happening today. And as part of our paradigm shift, we've got to say that's not an acceptable business practice, that it's not acceptable to have one standard for one homeowner in one community and a whole nother standard for an identically qualified homeowner in a different community. And so I believe that we've got to call it what it is and then look to correct it and move forward. Um, another aspect of this is 
tax incentives across the board for the production of housing. We've been producing housing the same way in America for the last 80 years. That's where you get a construction crew, they come to a lot, they build, they stick build the house, and then they move to another house and they move to another house. We have new innovations in home building, which I think is extremely important to looking at a paradigm shift. When we build automobiles, we don't build automobiles one car at a time. We create factories. And by the time the car comes out at the end of, of the assembly line, it is a fully complete operational vehicle that has met the standards of operation and assembly. I believe it's time to change our way in which we look at how do we produce housing. I believe mass production of housing using uh, modular and, uh, home pieces that are done in the factory in mass and exported to the site uh, is a, a way of producing housing quicker, more efficient, less waste in material. And those of you who've been keeping up with housing costs uh, uh, know that we're going through a lumber spike in addition to all the other increases that we've experienced in, um, in the home building industry. Uh, the lumber prices are escalating and going through the roof, which is a trickling down uh, effect on all of the other costs for homes that are using lumber. But we can look at creating across the country, establishing factories where homes are built and brought and assembled to the site. I know that in the past, you know, I, I've not been a proponent of mobile homes. Uh, I, I know that for a large percentage of our population, that's a, a cost effective, uh, affordable way of getting your home. But what I've been able to do with the looking at plants across the country, the, the, the modular built home today is not your 1950s uh, double wide mobile home. Uh, the, the quality of construction, the method of assembly on site has really been ele elevated and provides an opportunity for not only a timely delivery of a home, a cost effective delivery of a home when you look at the uh, reduction in waste, but also as we look at the issues of climate change, they are also uh, very energy efficient. And uh, I, I am originally from Houston, Texas. And so my whole, uh, the state of my birth has been on lockdown and is feeling the effects of climate change and the impact on the grid. And so when we look at producing houses that really are designed to produce the majority of their energy to look at saving on water costs. I think that that will go a long way, not only in, in helping us with our energy costs, but it's using all of the modern technology that we have available to us to be able to um, elevate the quality of housing and the speed at which housing is built. Another shift is that of the size of the house. Oh, the 90s were the, was the decade of the McMansions. Oh, but everybody doesn't need a McMansion. Everybody doesn't even want a, a McMansion. And I think that um, what I've seen in efficiency housing uh, and smaller homes, I'm amazed at the whole tiny home uh, 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 revolution, you know, across the country. People, two uh, person households, are finding that you can live in smaller space uh, as if it's well designed and efficient. And I think that having the ability to look at those neighborhoods or those housing units, whether they're rental or for sale, that are more modest in their size, but energy efficient, more efficient in spatial use and design should be something that we should be promoting and uh, promoting at every level and allowing for through zoning adjustments so that um, across cities and wherever there's an opportunity to uh, create housing that tiny or smaller homes should be an opportunity for consideration. 
And uh, what we're finding is more and more, particularly the older people get, they have smaller families. And um, the empty nester syndrome, particularly with the, as the baby boomer uh, numbers expand, is that we're going to need smaller homes and people are going to be looking uh, to downsize and, and, and having smaller options, uh, both to rent and to own, is really something that we need to not see as a negative or not, or de or not devalue, to place more value on you know, the larger McMansion home versus the smaller efficiency home. The real issue is we're in a crisis and we need to look at how do we bring as many units as possible uh, for those who are looking for those. And most families are consisted now of two parent, uh, two kid households and uh, a McMansion uh, may not be uh, what they can afford or even what's necessary at that point. So these are some critical uh, things that I think are absolutely important for us doing the paradigm shift. And it does require a paradigm shift because right now there aren't a lot of uh, tax credit incentives for employers. And so we've got to be able to not only support that, but look at legislation and then advocate on behalf of those large scale employers who would be able to benefit. Right now, there is not a disincentive for poverty. And I think there needs to be a shift. And that requires a change in the policy at the federal level so that the, the, the rug is not pulled out of people who are trying to move up. We often hear it stated, well, you know, everyone needs to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. Well, if just about the time you lace up your boots, somebody uh, pulls the straps out uh, and you don't even have straps anymore, you know, it's very difficult to move past that. I think that also um, the, the looking at how do we deal with the increases in, in, in our rents and in housing prices? If it's escalating far beyond the increases in wages and the increases in the ability for people to rent or to, be, uh, to buy a home, we do need, I'm talking about a paradigm shift, look at capping annual increases. Are we saying that it has to be a, a, a rental um, uh, guidelines that restrict people from being able to rent their houses? No, but I think we just, we, we're at a point where seeing 10% annual increases, 15% increases really add to or complicate, particularly on the rental side, the ability of people to rent an apartment and to stay in the rental of apartment. What we've seen throughout uh, the whole COVID-19 uh, pandemic is that people who had uh, in uh, jobs are now losing them, are experiencing a decrease in their ability to uh, maintain their hours at work. And so when you start combining that with annual increases uh, for housing, it's the perfect storm and it complicates and adds to a, a crisis that's already there. I think looking at the government getting engaged in financing housing production the same way that it financed it after World War II is an absolute must. We will be going around in circles until there is the recognition and the infusion of federal support to create neighborhoods, projects, and whole communities that did maybe didn't even exist before uh, to be able to accommodate the need for housing at differing levels of incomes, uh, but definitely on the lower income side. And so it's been, uh, these are some of the ideas that I have been, uh, not only me, but me and a number of others around the country have been pondering um, about the prospects of shifting. We cannot continue as we are and expect something different. And so it's going to require um, a lot of changing of the way we think and changing what we want our country to be and how we want to, 
to ensure that there is an opportunity for anyone at any income who's looking to find affordable housing, uh, that that housing be available to them. Our crisis was not created overnight, particularly in the African-American community, home ownership was devastated during the Great Recession and it has not rebounded. And so the loss of wealth in, in African-American families it has been just depleted because of the house, affordable housing, uh, the uh, Great Recession and the loss of housing through that. So you add that plus where we are now with the loss of incomes during COVID, it creates a crisis, but not only for African-Americans. I am the father of two young daughters who are young adults just getting started. And uh, I understand the challenges that they're facing uh, and, and looking at being latent with, you know, trying to get started and being able to find something that's affordable and decent uh, within a price range that doesn't deplete over half your income. So this is not just an academic exercise uh, for me. This is a personal exercise for me. And I'm taking it personally, and I'm looking to do something about it besides complain. I think that our work in the promise zone has really uh, shed light on the deficiencies, the decades, the organized strategic disinvestment and uh, blocking of, of resources in communities in Sacramento has led to many of the challenges that we're facing in our communities. So the, 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 the shift in paradigm thinking that I, I, I'm sharing is imperative. It's not some far away thing. It's right here in Sacramento. It's happening right now, even as I speak. And the good news is that we are all engaged in looking at how we can transform our communities through the use of land, uh, through the land economics. I know that uh, the membership uh, is made of many different people from many different prospects and industries and viewpoints of life and professions. And my challenge uh, is to you is to, to take the lead in looking at where we can um, move paradigm shifting that will over time address our housing crisis. We didn't get here overnight and we won't solve our challenges overnight, but we all have a role to play in addressing the issue. And sitting on the sidelines is not an option for people who, who have the ability to make a difference. And you have the ability to make a difference. The chapter has the ability to make a difference. And uh, I hope that uh, my time here today with you uh, has caused you to see some things and to maybe you, you didn't hear anything new, but I've spurred you to take action uh, or to think about things differently. Or I welcome all of you to join us here at the Sacramento Housing and Redevelopment Agency. The work in the Promise Zone uh, addresses housing, um, job training, and educational opportunities, uh, economic development. And we would welcome an opportunity to look at how we could partner with you to expand opportunity or to leverage the resources that we have. I've enjoyed spending this time and I'm very cautious of the time remaining. I want to pause and open it up to uh, any questions or give it back to Randy uh, to uh, guide us to the conclusion of our time together. Well, let me be the first to say thank you. The issues that you brought up are not new to any of us, but you have stated them in a cogent and compelling fashion. And you've raised some hard truths. And I thank you for that. And I know the members thank you for that. You've well, thank given, you. You've given us candidly, you know, we're all a very privileged group of people, honestly. We're all very fortunate. And I think you've given us something to think about. You know, I was reading a, an article uh, today by a guy named Anand Jiri Haradas, who's one of the finest writers I've read. I started reading him in the New York Times several months ago, and I just became a subscriber to his newsletter called The Inc. And today's, and I'll send you, I'll, I'll send you the article because I think you'd enjoy it. 
he talks about the American dream being alive in Denmark, not in America. And the reason that he said that, he's talking with an Iranian emigre um, uh, who has become a, a, a multimillionaire in Denmark uh, in the construction industry. And this fellow is, is going around the world suggesting to his cohort, millionaires and billionaires, that while charity is important, nothing will serve the, the betterment of the general population like government. And what that's going to result in or need is significantly higher taxation on people who already make a lot of money. And by taxing people and providing the wherewithal for government, as they do in Scandinavia, you have a much more robust safety net. And he points out that as the only child of a single mother growing up in Denmark, had there not been fully paid for education, comfortable housing, guaranteed health care, he never would have reached the heights that he's reached. In other words, even self-made people are not truly self-made. And um, uh, what I'll do, uh, I just saw Mary just sent a note. I'll send this article uh, to Suzanne. And if you folks could coordinate with her, she can send it back out. But honestly, it's, it's a compelling proposition that government has the ability, if properly financed and incented, to make change. And whether that's happening in underserved communities of color or, or otherwise, uh, that's where the power lies and that's where the potential lies. And charity, while important, simply doesn't have the traction necessary to create the rising tide that lifts all boats. So, um, so thanks. I mean, you're great. I really appreciate what you're doing. I love the colors tie in, by the way, where you guys are both at MIT. I think that's, that's so cool. Um, and I, I really appreciate the work you're doing in Sacramento. There may be some other questions, but I, I just want to say thanks. Yeah, if I could uh, jump in and ask a question, uh, Tyrone, I was impressed to uh, read about your arrival to Sacramento and your resume, but I'm, I'm inspired to hear you give voice to it. Thank you. Um, and my uh, daily life is in the architecture and planning realm. And um, we do a lot of housing uh, from uh, extreme, extremely affordable to um, uh, achievable market rate and it's a challenge, uh, no doubt. And I, I agree with you, modular is a wave of, wave, the way of the future, but uh, so far it's not proving to bring the economy to the projects at the end of the day. And maybe largely because so much of the cost in a project has nothing to do with what it's made of. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it, it is the promise of the future. We have to get it right. Uh, right now, everyone's trying, um, it's just, it's, it's clunky. Uh, but it's it's less clunky than building a stick at a time. So um, we need to all keep working at it. I, I'd like to say one thing you didn't address, but I'm sure you think a lot about is the right to shelter, homeless to shelter, and just the dignity of shelter. And and maybe I'll leave that if, if you want to comment. But I want to I want to mention one thing that we get frustrated with daily. We do a lot of tax incentive work with clients that are you know, competing for 4%, 9% tax incentivized projects, tremendously competitive. And um, there's really no room for any out of the box thinking fundamentally. Um, if you don't follow the rules, exactly Fair Housing Act or whatever rules there might be, which are terribly antiquated, you don't even get a chance to be at the table. And then you have to add other perks to your project to get, get heard. So. I think that's a fundamental problem. And one of the things I'll mention is, it's, I agree with you in terms of size. I spent the first almost decade of my life in the 50s in uh, a house that was funded by the GI Bill, uh, $5, $4,900 thousand square foot house, three bedrooms um, in that thousand square foot house and four kids. Um, and we didn't know that we didn't have a McMansion. It was perfectly fine. and and. My, my point is really that the, the 
the requirement for tax incentivized projects is um, one bedroom units that are almost 500 square feet, two bedroom units that are approaching 800 square feet, three bedroom units that are approaching a thousand square feet, which is totally ridiculous. It's you can do the square footage is great. You can store more things. Perhaps you can do more things, but but that's a real fundamental problem. Well, we could get more units, uh, more qualitative shelter for more people in the same square footage, and yet there's no way around that. If you don't if you don't follow those rules, you will not get um, your tax incentivized money. So uh, there's some other things I'd love to continue the conversation with you someday because you're somewhat preaching to the choir, but also you, you've taught me a lot just in this short hour. So I'll let, I'll let you maybe focus on the, on the tax incentivized um, projects and some of what you might see as the fundamental flaws in trying to th create a better mousetrap. Well, Jack, I, uh, I agree with you. Uh, it's my department that funds all of the affordable housing um, that needs a gap filled in both the city and the county. And I see John Chowry uh, on it. Uh, we work very closely with the city. That system is our system and it's absolutely broken. It is absolutely broken. The, the low income housing tax credit that was designed to incentivize affordable housing, the intent is wonderful. The implementation has grown and added costs and requirements, and you are right, it, it eliminates creativity, it confines everything to a cooker cutter uh, response, and then there's competition for the race to the bottom. Uh, and uh, I, uh, uh, I am engaged at uh, trying to work with uh, SIDLAC and TCAC and HCD, uh, uh, but all of those things are contributing and adding cost mm -hmm. to the price of affordable housing. That's why we keep hearing, and I understand people say, it's cheaper to go buy somebody a house than to build an affordable unit. That's and I understand true. that, because on the surface, the cost is, is extensive. But on the other side, you don't include its, its affordability for 55 years, and oftentimes if it's rental for special needs population, it doesn't include services, but we have a system that does not work well. And, um, and so I, am, I welcome all of you to reach out to me. I'm on LinkedIn and uh, um, I can share uh, my email address in just a few minutes so you can get something to write with if you don't have it. But yes, I, uh, I agree with you, Jack. And we're doing what we can uh, to uh, be a professional uh, thorn in the side about how we need to adjust, address these issues at the state level as well as at the federal level. Thank you. Yes, John, are you, do you have a question or are you waving? No, I, I have a question if I can uh, get in here. First of all, thanks for being with us, uh, Tyrone. Uh, you touched on many familiar themes there. Um, one of my regrets is that I didn't have uh, more time to do projects with you. Uh, but uh, let me ask you a straight up question here and keep in mind that there aren't any press people uh, uh, at this meeting, you can be oh, honest. Okay, that's, a, okay that, 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 that's, that's a precursor to a really good one, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. I, I have never put it to you straight in terms of what would you do to address the homeless problem. And do you still think, uh, or did you ever think that housing first as a national policy, much less a no local policy, was really the right policy to follow? So address the homeless problem where it just seems to me like your definition of insanity fits. Okay. Well, uh, and I do see that the recording button is still on, so I'm aware. <laughs> uh, but let's just talk about what created. Let's start with what created the homeless uh, problem that just didn't start today, but has gotten much worse. During the Reagan administration, 
there was a federal policy that was established that said, we are closing down the federal, the uh, medical facilities that address people with mental health problems. And we are allowing the states and the cities to come up with policies and procedures to address that. That was the beginning of the national homeless uh, crisis because many of the people who we see or who are experiencing homelessness have mental issues and have drug abuse issues. So you've got those people who have the issues and then you have other people who just had a hard time. They lost their job. Something happened in their finances and they lost their way. Those people just need a hand up uh, to be able to regain their self-confidence, get back in the job market, earn income, but you still got this growing, ever growing uh, part of the population that need medical attention, that must have some type of, of uh, controlled um, environments where they can either uh, continue in their state of, uh, of, of whatever mental issues they have, but get some help. Um, and then you have those who honestly do not want to live anywhere but outside, under the creek, um, and they live on their own terms. Those are three kind of populations. People who just need a hand up and they'll be okay. They fell off the white wagon, but they're trying to get back on. Those who desperately need to be admitted to hospitals or institutions with medical care, whether they want to be admitted or not. Uh, and as long as we allow there to be a decision as to whether you will be admitted to an institution or not, we will always have people uh, with mental illness and drug addiction everywhere. Because when you are mentally ill, you don't always make good decisions. When you are drug addicted, your number one thing is how do you get your next fix? Not how do you get housed and put your life on track? And we've been very timid about being adamant that you cannot just be out on the street. I know that in San Francisco, there was some legislation that kind of was kicking around the idea that people could be picked up and uh, carried to uh, a place to get some type of organized help. That didn't get a whole lot of uh, fanfare because it, you know, people feel like they're being kidnapped and hauled off and held against their will. But we've got to we've got to move from uh, uh, just allowing people to exist. And so, I do believe in housing. I want to say not everybody is going to benefit from a housing first policy that does not include medical attention to deal with their mental or drug issues. So that's a different kind of housing first policy. And the challenge is, John, we don't have a lot of places for those people to go. Right. And we're fooling ourselves if we think we can put, house them in motels and hotels, not address their core issues, and then release them back out into the population and everything will be all right. It's like a dog ch chasing its tail. And we find ourselves like so many other cities just in a cycle of insanity, uh, trying to do something that isn't working and won't work. I don't know if I answered your question, but I probably got myself in trouble. No, no you, <laughs> you did answer my question and, and you took a broader view, which is what I feel we have failed to do now for many, many years. Uh, add in there alcohol addiction along with drug addiction, and we sort of have the scope of things that need to be addressed. Um, Tyrone, uh, you hit my trigger point of exactly what I think needs to happen is before someone becomes homeless to addressing all those issues. I sit on the board of the Gathering Inn and it's a homeless shelter. I'm sure you've heard of it. 
And what you just said just now is the message I've been trying to get across that we have to change how we're doing it or it's never gonna change. So thank you for your passion. If you want to speak to any other groups locally and talk this passion, I mean, you spoke the words I've been speaking for so long that we have to change how we're doing it. So thank you. Very, I'm very passionate about helping the homeless not be homeless. And I've constantly said it's before they're homeless is where we have to start first. We have to help the families who are struggling to try and help, help their family members who are mentally ill or addicted to drugs or alcohol or whatever the case may, may be. So um, I connected with you on LinkedIn already and I would love to have a conversation with you to share passion, help get the word across and help make a difference. So I welcome you. the opportunity to talk with you, Bridget. So thank you. Just so that everyone will know, uh, I'm gonna share my email address. Again, I'm on LinkedIn, uh, but my email address here is uh, twilliams at shra.org. Twilliams at shra.org. It's in the chat. Uh, I see that uh, it's 12.59, Randy, uh, and now I'm gonna take my cue from you. Um, so I'm gonna pause. You're very kind and, and very, very perceptive. <laughs> Thank you. Um, with your permission, uh, we will conclude our meeting. Um, I just want to say that, uh, first of all, it's been great. Thank you very much. You're a bright light, and we appreciate you. And then uh, I'll mention that our speaker who is the cultural and creative economy manager for the city of Sacramento. I think you're all gonna enjoy her comments and uh, I look forward to seeing you all then. Uh, Nas? No, thank you, Randy. And thank you so much, Tyrone and everybody else who participated and um, stay tuned for more information on the next meeting. Thanks for coming. Bye-bye. Thanks everybody. Thank you all. Bye. Have a great day. You as well.